Okay, welcome everybody. Um, still have some people hopping on here, and so we're going to give it a uh, give it another minute or so. We see people joining as I speak, but thank you very much for joining today, and uh, we look forward to getting started in just about a minute or two. Okay, I'd like to uh, ask both uh, Jeff Adler and Abby to join, please. Hey, Daniel. Hi there. Hi. Hey. All right. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining today. And um, we're going to get started, even though there are still some additional people joining, but uh, we want to dig right into it. So um, thank you very much for uh, joining us in this um, webinar with the main subject being digital transformations impact on real estate, on commercial real estate. We have some great guests with us today who bring a, a, a you know, vast um, knowledge from their respective uh, industries, everything from technology to big data and uh, just uh, bricks and mortar real estate and, and, a whole, and the, the whole gamut. And so really excited to get into it and to discuss everything that we have to discuss today. I uh, am Daniel Farber, the CEO of HLC Equity, and I'd like to first ask uh, Abby Golhar if you could please introduce yourself to everyone. Yeah. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Really, uh, really appreciate it. I'm excited for the conversation. Uh, my name is Avi Golhar. I'm an entrepreneur, real estate investor uh, based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my main, what I do every single day is take a look at PE deals and acquire them, uh, whether it's a small business and uh, do a lot of digital turnaround, a lot of digital transformation to help these businesses grow and scale using tech. And there, I think they're phenomenal opportunities uh, for commercial real estate, for lenders across the country uh, to grab hold of technology to help them grow and scale the business. And of course, um, I love real estate. It's my number one wealth builder. So I love talking about that as well. <laughs> Great. All right. Thanks a lot. And we're looking forward to hearing how you have integrated that passion and love for real estate with your technology and entrepreneurial background. Uh, Jeff Adler, please. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Adler. Um, I run the Yardy Matrix uh, division of Yardy Systems, uh, and we really are a data set uh, that's used for investment due diligence purposes um, to find deals, to underwrite deals, and we have over a thousand clients uh, that use our data all day long. And so my job, I'm a former COO of an apartment REIT uh, and took this job about eight, year, eight years ago. And so for me, it's kind of a fun thing because real estate's this combination, particular multifamily, a consumer service, uh, as well as a, um, a financial service. And I get to sort of speak to interesting people, think about interesting things. So it's kind of fun. Uh, my prior background, uh, I was the head of brand marketing for progressive insurance companies back in the 90s, uh, developed that, um, that, that, that brand and also saw that industry go through a series of, tra of digital transformations. So I, I kind of been around this uh, a process for about uh, 30 years. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah. Very good. Okay, so if we can just get right into some of the subject matters. It, first of all, I think it would be helpful um, to hear from the two of you. And in, in, in obviously, we're relevant. I'm happy to chime in. But kind of from your point of view, the current landscape both from an economic standpoint, obviously on the real estate side as well, and then what is digital's role kind of played in yeah. uh, to this when we think about commercial real estate and digital yeah. transformation? So if you can uh, just kind of paint a picture what yeah. you see bro broadly in the landscape. So I would kind of start out from an economic standpoint and kind of real estate perspective, then maybe Avi can also hand it in terms of uh, uh, what, what he's seen on the digital side. Um, if you look prior to COVID, okay, uh, we had an economy that was growing, but was slowing. There was an inversion of the yield curve. We were going to get into some kind of recession after a very long recovery coming out of uh, the great financial crisis. Okay? What COVID did was put everything into this pressure cooker okay? and, and both accelerated and extenuated a set of um, uh, forces that were already there. And I would say in one big area, which is the notion of where you at, where office work is performed, blown it all up, okay? So there was already migration corridors. There was already high cost of living that was moving, I was having people move into lower cost cities. That was already happening, 
okay? There was already an aging of the population that had demographic implications. There was already trade pressures that were leading to a level of deglobalization and sort of, and, and some uh, beginnings of inflationary pressures, but those were moderated because they were all being sort of done slowly, okay? What COVID did was like smash it all together, okay? You had demographic acceleration, deglobalization acceleration, and housing kind of rejiguration, okay? Everything, all at the same time, okay? And so what we've seen is just this amazing sort of, while there was an initial downturn, rights and occupancies in the spring of 2021 blew open, okay? Because, and it was really driven by, in my mind, the notion that for office using employees, okay? That where you, for a, a, a much larger proportion of them no longer had to be tied to an office in a major high cost city. All that got blown up, okay? Now, also you saw, at least on our side of the business, Yardi Systems, which runs the property management infrastructure, we saw a sudden adoption of remote tools that were already there. So for the front office, self-guided tours, uh, digital leasing, leasing without seeing the property, virtual tours, everything that was digitally there, also that had been set up by the single family rental industry, right? But hadn't had to be deployed in multifamily, suddenly got deployed right away. All the back offices where people didn't want to have to work, rem you know, they didn't want to digitize a lot of their work, okay? All of a sudden they had no choice. They had to adopt all this technology. So technology in real estate is everywhere and always about cost reduction, okay? or, or en enabling communication that wasn't there before, okay? Now I'm gonna focus primarily you know, on the front of the consumer experience uh, or the sort of business to business experience. There's another whole side, which is sort of the investor relations piece, okay? Which is also kind of blown up and gone digital, right? People were raising money remotely, okay? I had friends of mine who were raising money and raising funds from people in Korea and Germany and all over the world that would, that would have required that they had be in person that the, suddenly they were doing deals remotely and they didn't have to do. And that changed like, you know, a bunch of friends of mine said, wow, I don't have to go to Korea <laughs> four times. I can do this thing, raise the money and we can deploy it real fast. So that's all changed. Look, but what hasn't changed is human beings are relational, okay? We do live in space. We do like to experience and have experiences with entertainment and, um, and dining and a lot of those other things. So once, once the world opened up, okay, while e-commerce shot up, okay, because you could buy stuff that was uh, uh, available to you, the notion of the importance of place, okay, for recreational activities, not for work, but for recreational activities has never been stronger, okay? And so, so we're now in two years beyond COVID, right? We've had vaccines. It's become sort of more endemic and less pandemic. We're now dealing with the hangover of inflation and the response to that, okay? And all of that's kind of laying out right now where we're still going through those, those effects, but, the, but, but the, 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 I'll call it the earthquake of where work gets performed has not, is not over yet, okay? And it has a big impact on real estate. Since real estate is rooted in the physical world, and so while you can automate transactions and the backbone, you're still living in a physical world, okay? And how people use space does drive kind of where you go and where the opportunities are. I'm happy to fill you in more and later. So Abhi, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, no, I, I appreciate that. So Jeff, what you're saying is um, all of the investment should be in the metaverse next to Snoop Dogg's. <laughs> no, right? I, like, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> at all. Um, I still believe in the physical world, um, but there is, you know, a level of, uh, of, of digitizing the, the backbone of, of, yes. of real estate where the opportunity exists and where the adoption has been fast. Yes. Oh. Um, so I agree um, with one, as interest rates increase, the cost of borrowing increases. Um, right. The credit, credit markets will obviously tighten up a little bit. And because we're seeing increased inflation, we have to be as business owners and also as investors in commercial real estate, we have to be very aware of what we can do to 
optimize the business or optimize uh, what we are what we're about and what we're doing one of the biggest ways we've seen that happen in commercial real estate is through virtual tours is through marketing automation as lenders specifically done a lot of work in the private lending space taking advantage of loan origination systems and really helping your employees and empower your employees to use the technology to grow and scale right now is ultimately i feel the best time to do that when everybody else is distracted if you double down on your business and you pay attention to using the right technology pieces you can really come out of this thing in the next year two years three years richer with more assets and more access to opportunities because you saw a good thing coming, which is using technology in your business to help scale. All right, I would also say, look, if you look at on an operational basis, right? The two nastiest parts of running a multifamily property is the leasing function, high yeah. turnover, very expensive people, and the maintenance function, okay? Who are constantly being recruited away for construction firms. Okay. The, the, and, and if you look at where the disaster, and I ran 160,000 properties for AIMCO, the, you, we, if the maintenance function was struggling, everything else was unwinding. It really didn't matter. Okay. Yeah. So, so when you look at automation, to the extent that you can put sensors in your properties that alert you to how to do preventive maintenance, to find problems before they're done. To, I've seen people do maintenance calls via Zoom. <laughs> it's like, hey, here's the play, here's the toilet. You hear how you jiggle it. And the consumer's right. like, I'm happy. Just don't come into my place. Like, <laughs> tell me how to fix the damn thing and don't show up. They're happy, right? Um, That's right. Specifically and, and, on HVAC, specifically on I mean, these are big units specific, that you can install these sensors on. And yes. to your point of preventive preventative maintenance that happens. What's interesting too is that you have a lot of multifamily apartment complex investors, they will outsource their uh, their property management, which I think is one of the biggest mistakes ever. To your point, that's where the dollar is made. Well, I would that's say, where... look, you know, uh, um, and, and if you're going to if you're going to outsource your property management, okay, then the other part is to have a good conversation about what systems your property manager is is utilizing. Okay, sometimes it could work to your advantage because some of these organizations can uh, uh, at level leverage scale. Okay, to do things you couldn't otherwise have made affordable, but are they doing that or not? It's a question. It's a con it's a conversation to have. Okay, um, uh, the same thing when it comes to sort of major building systems and the things that will destroy you are hot water heaters that burst and are not maintained and your HV HVAC systems, right? So it's it's really it's plumbing and HVAC. Now the roofs, you'll see the problem coming. Okay, and you can sort of deal with that. But but if you want to just destroy uh, value. The fastest way is let your hot water heaters burst without replacing them and flood your units. That will destroy asset value. Uh, uh, I think. I think to. I think to add that bad Google reviews. If you have a well, terrible onboarding side, right? process, right. right? If you have a terrible onboarding process, and uh, to your point earlier, lease agreements. And if you're still printing out lease, who prints out lease agreements? Who has a fax machine anymore? If you have these things, call me because I'm going to buy you. <laughs> like, this is perfect okay. for me. Yeah, I mean, that's the sort of thing where, where the transactions, right? If you think yes. about the transaction backbone of yep. running a multifamily property, the transaction backbone should be completely automated tip to tip. You, there yes. is really no need to touch paper anymore kind of whatsoever. So I'm sorry, doing... Abby. I, I was muted, but Abby, I was going to ask if they should call you or should they fax you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what 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 I really what I um I, I think that Abby, you brought in a really good interesting point, which is you said basically you know like the market is what it is right now, and that this is the time to kind of like double down on some of the technology features that may have been, that are easy to kind of like go on the back burner. So. Pre-COVID, you know, we HLC Equity as our operating brand, we have Layers, which is our operating brand, which is very much focused on kind of bringing in technology into our operations and seeing ways that we can streamline. We also have a whole service department offering and, and so on and so forth. But one thing that we actually very much focused on was the customer experience before COVID. And that got us to the point, you know, we had our we had a community app and in figuring out the leasing process and how we can automate that as best as possible. And it really thankfully put us in a position where we weren't like fully um, kind of like offering uh, virtual tours like across yeah. the board, sure. but it was something we could do. 
But as soon as COVID hit, like we were able to say, hey, like, you know, like no problem, like within a day or two virtual tours, here we are, we're ready to go. And then, and then kind of, so we had thankfully that down and there were, there were other areas though, where we said, you know, hey, we, we, we should, so we started investing more in kind of like our investor platform of HLC Direct and yeah. because we said there are so many tools today that allow us to go direct with our investors so that they can be with us, um, you know, and, and we can have direct communication with them. So that, that's when we kind of like launched HLC Direct, but it was exactly that of saying like, you know, we don't know, like, you know, call it March 2020 in April 2020, we don't know if we're going to do a deal tomorrow or in a year from now. So in the meantime, we're going to double down and invest in kind of like some That's technology right. features. I'm curious, like along those lines, if there's any other kind of thoughts that you guys have in terms of technology investments that are, worth, we spoke about some, but some that come to mind of like, you know, sponsors maybe sitting there and saying, hey, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to do a deal in the next half year, year, two years, whatever it may be. Um, you know, what, what should the focus be? Where should the focus be from a digital standpoint? Yeah, Daniel, to, to your point, like, Customer experience is everything, right? If you get something from Amazon and it, and, and, it, and it shows up broken, you're going to go to Amazon chat and get an entire refund for that, for that product because right. you weren't happy as a customer. The same thing uh, happens with groceries. If they pick the wrong non-organic, low-fat milk <laughs> or, or, or oat milk or something, right? And they're like, I want this brand and not that brand. You're on the, you're on Amazon chat and you're wondering what the heck is happening because Whole Foods yep. delivered this crappy order. Very similarly, we can have expectations of Delta, of any airline, of Amazon.com, of Whole Foods. And yet say as a, as a multifamily operator that's raising capital, we've got tenants, we've got all these moving parts. We can't show up for them that's kind of a right. weird double standard. To your point, mm -hmm. additionally, when we're raising capital, get your investors involved. Show them uh, a good experience. Set mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. apart from the crowd. Juniper Square is a great uh, piece yeah. of tech. It's expensive, yeah. but it's a good piece of tech uh, yeah. to nurture. And and, 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 well, and frankly, you already has the same thing. You know, kind of a, a, an uh, investor portal. But but yeah. the bottom the bottom line in all of this is. Customer experience right. is about your investors' customer experience as well as your consumers' ex ex experience. And I also have to say, it's also about your employees' uh, experience, right? Um, sure. Because at the end of the day, all these experience touch points, right, um, can be made more transparent via technology. And I think that's what Abby kind of is talking about, you know, as it relates to kind of investor tech, right? Is uh, transparency is what technology provides. So yep. transparent, right? So that so that yep. the transactions are transparent. It, and in real estate is known as a largely opaque business, right? It's it's sure. kind of it's kind of dark and messy. And so tech tech reduces the friction points and and in, improves the transparency. And, and and the reason I'm emphasizing you know, both uh, investor investors is, is absolutely there. But the if you have a lot of turnover among your employees, okay that will destroy your customer experience. So, so destroy it, right? So you can have a great sure. tech backbone, which where yep. the transactions are for, that are consumer facing, you should be able to incept, you know, find an apartment, incept a lease, move in, get your digital lock code, not necessarily your key, right? Um, you should be able to you know, set up, your, uh, set up your, your thermostat you know, digitally. You should be able to pay your rent, renew your lease, even move out without ever having to talk to a person. But sure. when you do talk to a person on site, you mm -hmm. want that to be uh, em empathetic, impactful, and, and positive. And if your employees feel like they are unloved or they're using manual processes that make their lives difficult, that bleeds through. I mean, it just sure. can't, it can't bleed through. It can't not bleed through. And right. it's not like I'm creating sort of new concepts Disney's known this for 40 years. I mean, there's nothing yeah. new here, okay? Sure. I'm not breaking new ground or anything like that. All I'm just saying is like, right. look, you know, all of these things, right? If your employees don't get paid electronically, have to go to the bank to cash a check, don't know how to change their benefits, uh, you know, don't, don't have, have good tech that allows them to make their jobs easier, right? And they're having to do a lot of manual things. They're going to look around and say, what am I doing here? <laughs> okay, sure. and so you know, so you need fewer people, but you need more engagement with the people you do have. 
and, sure. and, and it's hard I, enough to find employees that are good in the world today. Uh, for sure. one of my for one of my companies, I run a healthcare education um, healthcare education company. It's a tech startup. We're a very unique platform, and one of the companies I invested in. And let me tell you, it is so difficult. We've been looking for a specific role. I've already looked at 546 resumes. It's crazy. And you guys are feeling the pinch of this too. From an employee sure. satisfaction perspective, the last thing that you need is for a negative review on Glassdoor for some tenant to then say, wait, yeah, this, this sucks. And if you, God forbid, you want to sell your uh, apartment complex one day or whatever, yeah. they're yeah, looking yeah, at sure. thinking, yeah, that's going to be an issue. We're just going to discount what we're, what we're going to we're pay. pay. So, right. I, you know, so I, I, I'm interested in, so even before COVID and the government, you know, pouring trillions of dollars into the economy, I, I felt that, um, the dynamic had shifted when it comes to real estate investing and metrics that are used to kind of judge where we are in the economic cycle, because there, before we spoke about investors being direct with us, but you know, the phenomenon of crowdfunding and just all of this access that, that, that digitalization and also knowledge for that matter, you know, like every, I mean, you go on, you know, TikTok or Instagram and everybody is a multifamily owner today. And, and it's just, you know, there, there's, there's, um, uh, it's pretty wild. And I think that, that a huge piece of that is driven by digital, you know, digitization and just access that's been provided. You know, some cases, you know, it's great. Some cases it might be, you know, more challenging, but um, I, I'm curious. So, so like when I think of like GDP numbers and all kinds of other economic indicators, I'm wondering whether economists are actually taking into account the shifts that have occurred over the last 10 years um, versus, you know, the last cycle or, or 1980s or oh. whenever that may be. I'm curious what you guys think about that, but also more specifically, how digitization has kind of changed specifically real estate investing. Well, you know, so one, economists really aren't very good at catching these um, qualitative enhancements that then create right. leaps of, of, of yeah. connective tissue. What you're really talking about here is connective tissue, okay? so. It used to very much, if you go back, you know, okay, let's go back 15, 20 years, all right? First of all, if you go back 40 years, nobody, institutional investment in apartments didn't exist. Didn't exist at all, okay? It was office uh, and retail and maybe a couple of warehouses, okay? Multifamily as an asset class cre was created as an institutional asset class coming out of the SNL crisis in the late 80s and early 90s. Okay, the GFC, if you go up until the GFC, single family rentals were not an institutional asset class whatsoever, okay? Until there was a creation of a downturn, a buying opportunity, an aggregation, and the technology that enabled it to come. Now, it's an, now it is an institutional asset class. Same things happen with self-storage. Same things happen with, the, uh, with towers. Same, same things now beginning to happen with manufactured housing. All these other asset classes are becoming institutionalized, okay? Now, along with that, and this was happening already, it's been accelerated by COVID, along with that, right, the, the rise of crowdfunding, okay, has created a dem democratization of investment opportunities, but it's also, and I have to say, I'm partially guilty. I've, my, and my competitors created more transparency Okay, well, you could say, what are the rents here? What are the sales prices here? Some of that right. information is publicly available. Some of it's behind a paywall and subscription, but it's less, uh, less of a complete you know, uh, mystery as to how different asset types are performing. All right, so yep. there's, greater, there's greater, the technology has greater, greater awareness that things are out there, right? That, that if technology of, of raising capital has created more connective tissue. Okay, but also more asset types are institutionally invested than ever before. And some would argue that's good, some would argue that's bad. But I would tell you, in every place that institutional assets, institutional ownership has increased and visibility of asset performance has increased, values have gone up because the cloud or the distribution of uncertainty has come in. Therefore, prices can rise. You know, values right. can rise. Okay. And we're, and, and, there's just a, an aging of the population has meant there's more assets to deploy and the allocation of, 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 of all of the funds out there for retirement purposes 
have increased to um, to, to to real estate uh, from maybe five percent to to twelve to fifteen percent. So institutional investors haven't even hit their allocations of where they'd like to be in real estate. Okay, mm -hmm. so so that's fundamentally changed, and that's fundamentally changed because one of my mentors, Dave Swenson at Yale, changed the entire way a institutional investor thinks about portfolio construction mm -hmm. to include more private equity, to include uh, timber and agricultural and and real estate and other sort of uh, what that was called alternative investments, not only stocks, publicly traded stocks and bonds. Right. Those things have fundamentally changed the investment landscape, mm -hmm. fundamentally. Okay. Sure. And yep. and also we're getting capital from other countries coming yep. into the United States in a meaningful way because we are a store of value and in a deglobalizing, less safe and stable world. More capital wants to be here because the North America is one of the few places that is relatively self-contained economically. Like if the world shut down, we have enough food, we have enough energy, and we could make the other crap. And with Mexico, we have enough of a younger labor force. So, you know, if, again, if you if you were living some other place like Asia or the Middle East, right, or Europe, you're like, if I had to have a store of value, if everything went to hell in a handbasket. I want some right. money here in the United States, so I have some place to run to. Okay? Doug, I, don't, I don't know about you. I mean, I, I'm feeling I'm feeling a nice uh, a, a nice Tuscan uh, uh, cap <laughs> 2017. You know, I head on over to Italy. Come on, man. That's you can go. You can go to guy. you can that's go to right. visit. You can go to visit as long as it's open <laughs> for business. I'm all there, man. So um, you, you bring up a lot of interesting points. I I can sum it up in uh, in this. Investors have options. Uh, Crowd Street, Pier Street, the ability for transparency now, uh, right. man, um, everything, right? everything is is there for you to see. Who's the GP? Right. Who's the LP? Uh, who's doing what? Uh, how much opportunity is this person taking down? What regions, what uh, secondary markets, tertiary markets make sense? We take a look at a major fund like Blue Rock, for example, who has an, the single family rental market's been institutionalized right. around data. And all these guys are doing, everybody has a, has a proprietary algorithm. So you talk about technology and digitizing the way that you're identifying properties to acquire. I don't care what as a class it is. It could be commercial, single family. It could be um, industrial, it could be self-storage. You have access to next level, level data, whether it's Adam right. Data, whether it's Yardi, whether it's... Um, uh, what's the title of company? First American uh, title yeah, data. Right. All these data aggregators are giving or serving up everybody's information for you to make a decision. Now, you don't have to be uh, as erroneous as say, Zillow's algorithm. You can build one uh, that makes more sense for you, but you are you can identify tomorrow properties that make sense, bundle them all together and sell them to an XYZ fund that's acquiring. Right. Now, will that change? Yep. Will, will their demands change over time? Yeah, I mean, I've heard of uh, I've heard of institutional funds pulling out of markets because they're worried about what's going to happen in the Q and Q1, Q2 of next year. But mm -hmm. does that mean uh, they will stop buying altogether? No, no. this is America. Right. I, I, sure, last sure. time I checked, yeah, last time I checked, the uh, uh, we're still the the world's reserve currency, and even though Russia right. and China may have something to say about that, that's very unlikely uh, to happen. Right. So, <laughs> so I, I, I'm curious, you know, in all these discussions, and I was just thinking, you know, it, it kind of ties back to what we were discussing before um, with, you know, with COVID and, and Jeff mentioned, you know, I, I had all these colleagues and, you know, we, we certainly know of several and we also were able to build some great capital relationships, you know, throughout COVID over, you know, over just, you know, digitally, something that didn't happen as much it did happen but not nearly as much before and you know airbnb is famous for saying if we did an ipo you know over zoom then you can do anything over zoom and, and so on and so forth um so I'm, I'm really curious to so we have here somebody from a, a, a yardy that is um you know has a tremendous amount of data and then on the other hand abby you are you know are very um keen on building technologies and also utilizing technologies so do you guys think that in, in, in this day and age, it is possible to buy a piece of real estate without going to visit it? Absolutely. I, I think okay. you can. So call, call me a little bit <laughs> on the uh, skeptical side, okay? Because yeah. when I bought real estate and 
there are some things that you do need to go see. Like, for example, right. the electrical switches, the, the plumbing, um, how well the thing is constructed, has it been kept clean? You can do a lot of the financial due diligence. Here's what I can say. You can do a lot of the financial due diligence right, to sort of winnow down the number of opportunities you want to go after. And I think there's a tremendous time saving where you could basically, you know, take a, take, you know, right now, if you're an institutional investor, you may get a hundred OMs dumping on you every day and you're going to do one deal or two deals, right? Right. So uh, if I can improve, and I do improve the efficiency of that winnowing process, so you're only focusing on the opportunities that really make sense for you, yeah. okay? I think there's deep value add. But call me a little bit on the sort of old school side is the stuff can still fall apart, okay? And I've seen everybody screw over people every single way you can think of. Like I've been through every disaster, a fraud, or mm -hmm. oh, you know, sort of ex extension of the truth, right? As it relates to the physicality of the asset, you are buying something that falls apart. Right. Trust me, real estate, the minute you get it is falling apart. So right. the question is, do you understand the physical side, the physical nature, okay, is the thing that has to be grounded. Now, can you do inspections? Can you get other things that, again, reduce the amount of time that you spend on that? Yes, I think you can. Okay. And have some people bought, if, again, if the asset is so cheap that who cares, I'll buy, you know, I'll, I'll put a reserve for, for sort of the, the physical asset falling apart and it's still worth doing, right. great, go for it. Okay. But if, if, if it's getting, if the deal's getting tight, if you're not, look, if somebody isn't looking at the physical asset, sure. you are, you know, basically giving up yeah. your your future to somebody else so that's that's right. what i would say that, that, that right there's a range for sorry so, I love you, so just for the right. record so just for the record it, 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 it there it's it's um there's a reason that real estate investors depreciate their assets <laughs> from an accounting <laughs> standpoint and yeah. uh, and, and it generally um, happens between December 15th and December 30th. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's the right. financial state. The, the, right. the, the, the building is still falling apart every day. Right, right. right. I'm saying it's still, it still is depreciating. And, um, you know, obviously a big part for passive investors, and this is why passive investors invest with HLC and other, other groups, is because we do that type of work, you know, sure. for them. But I, I always, um, you know, it, it, it's a conversation because I think that, you know, they're maybe there will be a time one day when you can, I, obviously there's going to be, you know, the need to inspect and so on and so forth, but where you have so much data coming from so many different um, places, including, you know, building sensor data and so, so on and so forth, that yeah. maybe, you know, there were people, well, I, I think, I don't know that I would ever feel comfortable doing it, but there may be people well, who will become more and more comfortable doing here's it. Here's where I think yeah. if you had an organization, okay, that actually would warranty the physical condition mm -hmm. and step in and say, we've done the work, we warranty it. We're willing to basically commit to maybe a CapEx plan. Okay, all right. And so, so other people can, can basically say, oh, well, all right, I can buy the deal because the physical thing, the physical right. part of it has been warranted, or I can outsource the expense and I know what my exposure is, okay? And you maybe you as an investor, they're only dealing with turn costs, but all the everything else is like on the equivalent of a condo sinking fund, right? right. If, if you had something like that, then I think you could probably go all the way there because you know that's the one thing somebody's got to stand behind the actual structure, okay? Right, or yeah. warrant the the environmental exposure, or you know that there there's a physical nature, but if you could sure. offload that to another yep. entity who had the capital structure just to, right. to basically say, yeah. yeah, you know, I've got this covered, you pay me a fee and, and you can, you basically can, can, can offload that exposure. Then I think you could go there. Right. So Daniel, what, what, what yeah. you're going to see is um, Jeff and I co-founding a company called go CapEx. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we're, we're looking for crowdfunding investors as of in 20 minutes, 20 minutes the right. landing page. All right. Go. Sounds good. We'll throw the link. Yeah, we'll throw the link in the follow up. Email. <laughs> right. So I think to Jeff's point, we, we have an opportunity now where you know, virtual wholesaling is a big thing. Um, 
And it, even if you're not a wholesaler, let's say, and you are a real estate investor and you're looking at opportunities, you can hire somebody, grab, the, do FaceTime on your phone and have them walk the property to see if it's even worth doing uh, and worth visiting the property in person. I'm, I'm of the same sentiment as Jeff a little bit, except probably a little edgier in that um, I don't mind taking a little extra risk, but at the same time, I want to drive the car before I pay for it, right? I want to make sure it's not a lemon or it's not a, it's not a Flintstone car. Uh, for those of you uh, that are younger, old enough. 20, yeah, that, are, that aren't old enough, you know, it's, it's just go look it up on Google, it's a thing. Um, and so, and so FaceTiming, I think is important. Uh, there are though companies out there that will take the historical pictures of the property. They'll take them in from Google images, or you can't do it from Zillow anymore because they've restricted their data uh, and you can't copy, um, you can't copy the pictures, but regardless, you can, you can, they've, they've created an algorithm to analyze the pictures over a period of time and fed this AI enough data. So this AI knows this property was say condition four out of six, two years ago, or four out of 10, two years ago. And today it's eight out of 10. So maybe there is a long-term flip opportunity that this current seller has here. And maybe uh, given these economics, given the current purchase price, previous value as is value and cost of materials, cost of labor, total square footage, it will come up with a model that's representative of maybe it's a good buy, maybe it's not. That I think is important, but it's also millions of dollars in R&D. And I think that's a challenge. You have these larger institutional funds that will play that game. Uh, right. for, the, for the solo investor, I don't recommend it. Right. Yeah, yeah. 100%. But I, but I, one, thing, one thing that is a, a spinoff or a downstream effect that I'm going to kind of highlight and it may be relevant for what you're doing, Daniel, is there are smaller metropolitan areas in the U.S. that were never sort of, they were basically losing population. They were dying on the vine. They were being drained, okay? And the notion of where, uh, again, it doesn't take a lot of people that no longer have to work in a major metropolitan area or are basically, what we're seeing the highest rent growth is happening in what we call overflow markets. So it's not Phoenix, it's Tucson. It's, you know, it's, it's the overflow. It's the smaller cities where even that, net, that, that the first top 50, there's, there are six international gateway cities. There's about, 30 kind of like major metropolitan areas. And then there's 20 to 40 to 60 of these overflow markets. The, the, the action right now is in these overflow markets that are still relatively cheap, that don't require a lot of people being able to move to them, right? To, to keep them sort of active and interesting. And the pricing is, is you know, there's not a lot of supply and it, it, it will respond slowly and it's not yet institutional grade. Right. So if, so if you're looking for a syndication or a smaller investor, you know, they're, they're and again, not all of these are created equal and they do come with more sort of economic exposure. Um, but there are places that are sort of saying, hey, you know what? We could find a future as a hub for remote work. Right. We have a good lifestyle and we don't have to appeal to everybody and we're not going to get everybody. OK, right. but if I had 20, 30,000 more residents, right. that will is the flip over in making this a viable metropolitan area. And it's very interesting. It's actually a big deal because, again, pre-COVID, there were these huge number of papers from Brookings and other institutes saying, oh, my God, you know, the, the, the country's hollowing out. It's all going to be concentrated in six cities. And this is a massive social problem, right? And so COVID and the, and the sort of notion of where you have to work from for office work has rejiggered, okay, these issues. It's, re, it's changed the affordability kind of dynamic, all right? Um, mm -hmm. And it's also changed the, 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 the geographics um, kind of menu from which one can pick. Sure, 100%. I, I also think that there's that that there's kind of like a, a psychological uh, reset that people have done, which is like, do I want, you know, I actually thrive in cities and I love cities, but at the same time, some people say, do I really want to be running around, you know, the streets of busy cities all day, or do I want kind of like the, the piece of some of these towns that you're talking about, or, 
or these overflowing. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're not going to be like, you know, villages. It's not hamlets we're talking about. Right, right. We're oh, yeah, small, sure. Right. We are talking right. about, you know, there, there, is, there is a small urban core to these. Yeah. Right? They're no, just 100%. not nearly as big as other places. Right. So, uh, so right. we're looking at markets that are, say, secondary in nature, not necessarily tertiary. Right. So I, maybe. Or, or say, like tertiary too, like a, like a Columbus, Ohio, for example. Yeah, I think well, Columbus, Ohio is absolutely on the road. All right, Macon, Columbus, Georgia Ohio. Is on the road I mean, track. it's on fire. Columbus, Columbus yeah, is Columbus on is, is on fire, right? And, right. Uh, and I would say Indianapolis, even. Right? Indianapolis is is sort of considered is is it a? It's not really a major city. It's kind of a minor city. It's lower cost. It's a very, very pro business. The sure. rents up there are up thirteen and a half percent year over year. Like when I was operating in, in Indianapolis, if you got two. Man, you were a, you were a lucky duck because the big yeah. concern in Indianapolis was that the capex exceeded your rent growth, so you were basically you know operating into it into the ground, right? So yeah. so there are way more places. I mean, way more places: uh, Jacksonville, right. Pensacola, uh, that have good business environments that that are you know pleasant weather. Indianapolis is not pleasant weather, but it's a great place to live. You know, I'm, right? I'm, Go I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not knocking on uh, on Indianapolis, but there's. Right. A lot is a much broader investable universe. Okay. And right. part of it has been driven by technology. Okay. And part of, of what we in which you would which you can add value is is because providing access to these opportunities, okay, that most people would not have considered on their radar screen. Right. Sure. And so part of that is enabled by digitization because you can you, you know, as an as an investment syndicate, you can basically shine a light on these things mm -hmm. much more cheaply sure. right and you can actually do virtual tours and say hey you know the place isn't fall you know the town isn't you know falling apart there's a vibrant right. town here so i think that, that that's provided a lot more again i kind of use technology as connective tissue right sure it's the connective tissue uh that enables sort of other things to happen and i think there's sure. a, a broader opportunity than there was uh before yeah, I agree. I think it, the, the three buckets, I suppose, of technology we're talking about to be that connective tissue. Um, one is the investors. Uh, you want to provide uh, not only accurate reporting, opportunities, et cetera, possible nurturing email campaigns inside of one system, something that HLC uh, is doing a very good job of. Number two, uh, your tenants. If you're acquiring, say, multifamily apartment complexes, making sure your tenants are happy, your employees are happy. Uh, so you're on, uh, on property resources. And then uh, last but not least, the third bucket I like to think about it as is the physical property. Uh, so to the, the beginning of this conversation, Jeff and I were going back and forth on, say, the, um, the signals that we'd be getting from the HVAC system, letting us know that, hey, okay, the runtime's about complete. This thing's about to blow in six months. We should consider replacing it. That preventative maintenance uh, will cause less headaches later down the road. And frankly, uh, you might be able to charge a little extra premium uh, to the buyer of that apartment complex because you have been smart about taking care of the asset uh, the way that it should have been in the first place. And when we talk about this, as, as Avi's mentioning, is that there's been, like, it's relatively well known, right, that technology talks to people, right, and investors, and, but what's new is I'll call the internet of things, right? And, and really this sort of notion of the building talking, the building is talking, is really right. a, a, a leverage of the internet of things and would not have been possible without sort of wireless networks and, and, and the sort of infrastructure and maybe 5G coming along, right? In certain places where you can have a monitor, it can be relatively cheap. It can always be communicating, it can always be feeding data and then it can throw up red flags. That just wasn't possible before, okay? Sure. And yeah. it's, it's kind of a bit of the, front of the new frontier uh, that the building speaks. I never had the building talk before. Yep. So yeah. this is this is really an interesting topic. Uh, I'll dive into this for maybe 15 or 20 seconds. Let's say you have a signal, right? So let's take this a step further. Um, and Jeff, maybe maybe you know this, maybe you don't. If you don't, I, I hope it blows your mind. And then same thing with you, Daniel. So let's say that we have a signal on the HVAC that it's just not working and it's going to be shut down today for whatever reason. You can create a totally fake person online. Like Google has this, it's like um, um, this person does not exist.com. Okay. So if you go to this person doesn't exist.com, it creates a real human face and it says, and it, it's it, this person doesn't exist. Right. It is a complete, it's a complete AI generated face. Now you couple that 
with um, Daniel's like, I'm gonna see where this guy's going with this. So <laughs> you couple that with say a, a signal from your HVAC saying, okay, it's about to blow in two or three months and we should be ready for this. If you take your JPEG, you can render that into a 3D model and that 3D model can talk this, talk the words into existence as if it's a real human being reporting something. Huh. It's so the building can talk you're, actually. Your building is literally talking based on what's happening inside of it. So you're giving this bit, this building a personality, like wow. name it, I don't know, Steve. That's and cool. Yeah. You can deep fake, um, you can deep fake it. And it's just, it's absurd to me. Have you ever gotten those LinkedIn messages where it says, hi, Daniel, hi, Jeff, and sure. you know it wasn't, you know. Right, right, right. Yeah, you. it's a bot. Right. Yeah, yep. it's exactly bot. what they're saying in that video is, hi, first name, welcome to HLC yeah. Equity. <laughs> right. And that first name subs their, their name, their name uh -huh. substituted for first name, but it's like right. you yep. saying it. So right. anyway, you can go super That's deep down this rabbit hole. Well, I mean, you think about, the, about that, then... That that bot could actually then order the part. Yeah. I want to. I'm going to order the part and set up the work order. Okay. Yeah. To go replace the unit in 45 days, and then I'm going to enter it into the property management system as a ticket, and then, and then sort of, and then when the thing gets cleared, then the bot will close the ticket out. Yeah. Right. And so you That's could have a ver you could have basically another team member which is the building, right? Not the maintenance tech, but the building is a virtual team member. So, so- um, Pretty cool. Dude, so yeah. Jeff, uh, so Daniel, Jeff and I are co-founders. Of, <laughs> of another, uh, another business. <laughs> of, a new, of a new tech startup. Did, well, we're not, we're not get, we're, we're only doing two this evening, <laughs> but you guys will continue the conversation tomorrow and you might think of another one. I that, that, I mean, that's, that's what came to mind immediately. Like, well, what, well, why don't I just have them order the part? Order right. the yes. part, set it up, close the ticket, and then it never went through. Because right now, if you think about the process, and I unfortunately know way more about this than I ever would have wanted to know, right? If somebody <laughs> somebody has to, like, again, in the, in, in the current world, right? A physical tech has to do a manual inspection, right? Which they never get to do because there's always some other disaster happening. Right. So they never actually inspect what they're supposed to inspect. But if they did inspect it, they'd have to identify the problem, create a work ticket, enter the work ticket, uh, or somebody has to order the, the, the service, someone has to approve the transaction from a budget standpoint, then it has to go to the vendor, the vendor has to accept the call, the vendor has yep. to schedule it, they have to know that they yep. actually showed up, actually did the work, create an invoice to actually get paid, which goes through the budget process again, before that whole that whole ticket actually gets closed, okay. If you makes complete have, sense. If you if you actually had virtual virtual Bob, virtual Mary, do yeah. all of that and just yeah. clear it and say, yeah, we ordered it, we set it up, we verified it, it got done, it's already in the system, and no human touched it, but the building took care of it, right? right. And also automated the uh, check writing and the approval process, and the vendor got paid electronically you basically would drive a lot of the crap out of what it takes to physically run a property. And I you know, ran, you know, I had 4,000 employees. And let me tell you, the dr they were drowned in this administrative crap that they couldn't, you know, getting to actually talk to a person and build a relationship was like the thing they did in their spare time because yep. the administrative trivia that it took <laughs> to run the property, right? And I'm not even talking about clearing delinquency balances and doing collections. Right. It, is, it is a mind-numbingly difficult, tedious job. So Jeff, tell me, how you, tell me how you really feel. Uh, this is yeah. this <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Well, I mean, because this, I, this was my lived existence you know, for, for yeah. 10 years, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and these are the things that we, the, the, the tech that's being built since then it's been all been driven by the stuff of points of pain that I and other of my colleagues have been sort of communicating like, yes, and it's really hard to keep people in an industry, right, when it's so difficult for them to do their jobs. That's right, guys. So this is this is really great. And in and, and along the lines of what what we've been discussing, and actually, so you know, we came up with 1000s of different ideas here. And I'm sure that we could go on for 
several hours and, and come up with additional ones. But if we can come up with maybe some, um, so just as an example, when uh, when Abby was discussing kind of like the, the status of a, of a building, in my mind, it's like, that's something that blockchain could like, you could know the exact status of, you know, what's happened to your building um, historically. Um, that's just well, one well, example. Okay. Uh, if, so, if, here, here's just another yeah. answer. If every work order on every property and every construction job and every payment right. was actually moved to a blockchain so, yep. so that the entire capital maintenance history yep. was, was, was available as a underlayment, okay? It, that's a law, that's a big, that's a tall order. But if that that's were true, order. that's a tall order, okay? But that would create the transparency on the operating expenses that you right, just yeah. don't have today. The capital and operating That would create expenses. way more transparency than any seller would, would like to. <laughs> right, to I mean, yes, that. right, right. I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? But you would create transparency. Right. Uh, okay, the other thing is, if it was also married up, because sometimes uh, the fact that they didn't do anything has created a deferred liability. Right, for maintenance. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you marry that up with what actually is the recommended capital expenditure kind of flow, and you marry it up with here's the historic verified payments. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you got. Hey guys, you, you I, got I, will, I want to real quickly. We oh, we only have a, a few. No, no, I I appreciate that. It's very <laughs> it's very relevant. We only have a few more minutes here, and okay. I want to kind of like to leave on some actionable. Um, items, but for the future. So if, if you're looking at, you know, we've discussed some of it, but if there's anything else that you kind of like within your guys specific areas of that you're working, you know, within Yardi and within your entrepreneurial work, um, Abby, where, where are there kind of like, where do you see us going both in terms of the economy and in terms of how, you know, digitization plays into that? Um, yeah. Um, so one of the things that I would absolutely take a look at is understand what your current state is. It doesn't matter if you're a commercial real estate investor, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the hell it is that you're doing, right? Take, take, a, take a current state of your operations, take a current state of your company and understand the modules that are running it. So for example, if you're raising capital, then that capital feeds into an acquisition and that acquisition has its own internal operations. Understand the tech stack that you can use and leverage to empower your employees to get better. They'll get happier because now they're not doing the administrative bullshit that you are having them do. You'll get happier because you have had your employees. Everything will just start to gel as uh, as Jeff says, it's the what is it, Jeff? You called it the glue. It's not the glue. It's the, the connective um, tissue. Thank you. The connective tissue. Uh, the connective tissue inside your organization. This applies to uh, commercial real estate investors. This applies to apartment it's SFR, in, industrial, self storage, lenders. Uh, there's so much opportunity here in low hanging fruit. Simply put. If you have an investor email database and of say a hundred people and you're only nurturing 20 of them, you're missing out on capital that you could you could tee up for acquisitions in Q1, Q2, and Q3 of next year. And those conversations need to develop over a period of time. Securing the property, securing the property, whether it's alarm sensors or sensors on HVAC, sensors on you have sensors for everything these, these days. Identify the asset class that you're in, identify the most important sensors for you and install them and start having them talk to a main dashboard. And if you have to hire a virtual assistant offshore to give you a report on what this dashboard is and what it's reporting to you, then fantastic. Do that as a good, minimally viable product step one and iterate from there. Start with current state, identify what you need and iterate until you can scale what you need to. Thank you. Great. Jeff, please. What I would leave you with is, um, is really more understanding the context that goes into what Avi just went through, okay? Um, and so I would just highlight two authors that I like, like read all the time and former backdrop. Ray Dalio uh, just wrote a book on the changing world order, uh, as well as Peter Zion just finished up a book on uh, deglobalization and demographic change. Those are the broader themes Right, the broader themes, which if you understand where the where the where the puck's going to 
in terms of like, you know, the next 20, 30 years, then you're basically saying, okay, I know where the puck's headed demographically and I know ge geographically, right? Then I can take Abby's framework and say, okay, this is how I'm going to move my business in, in an iterative fashion. You don't, things don't get done, honestly, in my view, in like these quantum, like revolutionary leaps. They get done by a, a serious level of quickening the iteration cycle. The faster you can go through the iteration cycle, learn and repeat is actually how you actually get things done that actually generate returns and you actually can get deployed, right? So people who wait for like, you know, the greatest thing to, I'll wait 10 years for everything to be figured out. By that time, the leaders have gone five, right. 10, 20, 30 cycles already, and you'll never catch up. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So you, you do have to kind of get into it, right? Commit to doing something, start somewhere. Okay. And iterate through it. And the sooner you get started, the sooner you'll get done. And, and you'll be on a path that takes you and your business, you know, in a, in a much better direction. Okay, great. Thanks. I want to uh, close any other closing um, remarks from you guys in terms of both what you're working on and, and where people can find you. Yep. Um, I'm always looking for, uh, if you have a fax machine, machine seriously, uh, call, call me. Like going back to this thing, uh, it's, uh, yeah, like just, we've got to talk. Um, it's called Hobby Goal Hard Does Therapy dot com. Uh, no, I'm, just, I'm kidding. That's not where you can find me. You can find me anywhere online at Abby Golhar. Um, I will, I'm always interested in uh, unique PE deals uh, tying to real estate. So, for example, dentist office is something that I'm going after pretty heavily this year and early next year. And that, for me, is a, is a pretty unique opportunity to aggregate wholesale out later down the road. Um, but tying tech to something that is old, obnoxious, slow, and stale always gives it this new fuel. And we're, we're now entering a world where uh, seniors uh, are offloading their businesses. They're selling assets. And sometimes they don't want to sell, their, sell these assets or transition them in some succession plan to their heirs. They just want to say, no, sorry, wow. I want to sell them. So there's an opportunity right there for folks, whether you're in M&A, PE, or in the real estate space to grab a hold of assets at a bargain. And I think that's going to happen starting next year. You can find me anywhere online at Abby Goldhar. I think I said that. Um, I think I said that. Yep. Yeah. Good. Thank uh, you. Great. Uh, Jeff, please. Uh, yeah. My, my company is yardymatrix.com uh, or you can Google me uh, and you'll be basically be directed back to yardymatrix.com uh, is where kind of we live. Uh, and um, Happy to chat about uh, any of these things, um, and uh, you know it's been uh, it's been a great time, Daniel. It's been, it's great, been cool. great. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank all you right. to all the attendees, and uh, until next time, thanks a lot from HLC Equity. Okay, take care. All right, bye bye. Take care. Yeah.